Good morning, First Baptist. Good morning, Good morning First Baptist. Good morning. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will do what? Rejoice. And be glad in it. He's got to get amen. amen. It's prayer time. Yeah. If you might stand to your feet, come across the aisles. You can kneel where you are. If you need to sit, that's fine with me. God has placed it on my heart today that I can feel a lot of pain that we're going through. And I would just ask that you release that pain and give it to God. He's in control of everything. Do we agree with that? How many of you here right now feel defeated? That's okay. But we know who our creator is, right? We know who our deliverer is, right? We know who our provider is, right? He tells us a lot of time in the scripture, says, by your belief that you have been healed. It's by your faith that you have been healed. For you to have the healing that you desire, for you to have the release and the relievedness of the pains that you're suffering right now, you have to believe in your heart. You have to have faith. And that is our belief, correct? As we pray today, I would ask that you really put aside anything that's a distraction to you right now and give it all over to God. He says his yoke is easy. Give it to him. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. A lot of us are suffering. A lot of us are in need. But Heavenly Father, we know that you are able to do all things more than we could ever imagine. And so right now, Heavenly Father, we would ask that you just receive our praise. Receive our thankfulness for everything that you have brought us through because we are here right now. No matter what we're going on, what's going on in our lives, no matter what is afflicting us, you are still due all the praise and worship. We are thankful for you. We are thankful for each day that we are able to wake up and serve you. Paul asked if he could remove that thorn from his flesh three times, and three times you told him no, because your grace, your mercy is sufficient. Heavenly Father, you have allowed us to wake up this morning. You allowed us the opportunity to gather in your house of prayer. And right now, we just ask, Heavenly Father, that you would just be with us through our storms, through our trials, through our tribulations. You never said it was going to be easy, but you said if you would just cling to me, you would keep us in perfect peace. So Heavenly Father, right now, help us understand the peace that you're talking about. Help us understand the joy that the world can't take away because the world didn't give it. Heavenly Father, we love you beyond measure, but help us understand what love really is. Love is not always a happy moment. Love is a sacrifice. And we're willing right now to sacrifice some of the things in our life that you may be praised, that you may be truly worshipped. We would ask that you encamp your angels around each and every one of us in our circumstances, Heavenly Father, that we will be able to bear the trials and tribulations that you have placed upon us, because we know that we're not in this by ourselves. You are with us. You have always been with us. It is us that leaves you and you not that leaves us. So Heavenly Father, just draw us back into you. We are grateful. We are thankful for everything you have brought us through. There's a lot of praise reports, Heavenly Father, that just don't go out. But you're the only person that could have fixed and changed that situation. There's a lot of suffering right now, a lot of broken hearts, a lot of mourning. But we know that joy cometh in the morning because our joy is in you. Heavenly Father, you are all things to us. Help us keep our eyes set on the prize. We have work to do. We have work to do. This world is hurting right now. This world is suffering right now. And help us take our mind off ourselves and place it on your will, Heavenly Father. 
Help us to go out into this world and proclaim the gospel, Heavenly Father. Help us to go forth, Heavenly Father, and do whatever it is that you have placed in our hearts that your will may be done. Encourage us, Heavenly Father, and help us to encourage one another. Help us to love one another as you have ordered us to do so. And help us, Heavenly Father, be free of all the burdens that we place upon ourselves. The rain falls on the just and unjust alike. But Heavenly Father, you are our sunshine in the storm. You are our shelter in the storm. You are our provider in the storm. You have given us everything that we need to be successful. And we would ask, Heavenly Father, that you would just receive our prayer today and our thankfulness and our praise. We love you, we adore you, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Because if it wasn't for your son, Jesus the Christ, who died on that cross, who rose with all the power, Heavenly Father, who stands on the right side, who is our advocate, who you hear from for us, who covers us in his blood. Heavenly Father, he, he washed us, he purged us, he cleansed us, and he didn't have to do it. So Heavenly Father, we give him the glory, give him the honor as well, because without him, we would be nothing. Heavenly Father, please forgive us for all of our sins, for all our lax ways, for all of our evil thoughts, and help us to become more than what we're able to see, but everything you've anointed us to be. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name, I pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen.
All right, it's time for uh, acknowledgement of visitors. If we have any first time visitors, could you please stand? Amen, amen. Please remain standing as we'll have an usher come give you a welcome packet. We just glad, uh, grateful and glad that you're in our service today. And we would just pray that you would uh, receive the, uh, the word that's going forth. And you're blessing us with your presence today. Amen. We have some announcements here today. First announcement would be the, uh, in regards to uh, Lucille O'Bannon's husband, Mr. Ted O'Bannon, the funeral arrangements. Visitation will be Friday, November the 10th, hours 5 through 8 at Pruitt Funeral Home, 425 North Main Street, Newcastle, Kentucky. The funeral will be Saturday, November the 11th, at 11 a.m. on the same at Main Street Baptist Church, North Main Street, Newcastle, next door to the funeral home. First Baptist has been invited to First Baptist Church, Eminence, Kentucky, for Reverend Charles Duncan Jr.'s 14th year pastoral anniversary. Dinner will be served at 1:30 p.m. and service will begin at 3:30. They are located at 5706 Main Street and Blackby, Blackaby Eminence. Uh, is that today? That is today, I'm sorry. Veterans Recognition Sunday. Recognize all active, former, and family uh, members of veterans. Let's give them a round of applause for service. Sunday, November the 12th at 3 p.m., First Baptist uh, Church of Jeffersontown has invited, has been invited to worship with Zion Baptist Church Incorporated, where they will celebrate Pastor Gerald Joyner's 12th year anniversary. And the colors are going to be tan. Uh, all right, I've never seen that spelled. Taupe with black or white. I was going to say uh, tope or something. Like that. Thank you all English teachers. And last but not least, we have Thanksgiving Praise Sunday. That's going to be November the 19th at 6 o'clock p.m. at Eastside Praise Church, 6300 Billtown Road. To all of our people streaming live and on radio right now, we just want to welcome you. We want to give you some information in regards to if you have anything you would like to share with us or if you would like to respond to us in any way, shape, or fashion. Our address is First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town, 10,600 Watterson Trail, Jefferson Town, Kentucky, 40299. And the telephone number for the office is 502-267-6121. And uh, you can send it to uh, Reverend Kevin L. Nelson, Sr., our pastor. And we do have an announcement, I'm sorry, for our couples ministry will be this Friday at 630 in the multipurpose room. This will be the last couples ministry of the year. Uh, that is a uh, phenomenal ministry, and we would ask all couples, this is not a counseling for troubled couples. This is a Christ-given ministry to all couples in Christ to teach you, to share with you, to minister to you, and to bless you with the written word of God. So I would ask that you would come out this Friday at 6.30 in the multipurpose room and make the last uh, class, the last uh, meeting or class for that ministry an exceptional ministry. It's not that hard to do. And I promise you, you will be blessed. Oh, thank you. I'm hard of hearing. You're just listening to loud music. If we have any veterans in the uh, in the congregation, could you please stand today and be uh, acknowledged? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. We thank you for your years of service, and our prayers have always been towards you, and this country thanks you. Amen. Uh, we want to do our offering now. Y'all can tell I'm a little rusty at this. If we could go ahead and have our ushers prepare our offering. If you would all stand.
Cheer up, church. This is the time that we give back to God, okay? Cheer up now. Offering is a very important but soft-spoken subject in church today. You need to really understand that we're not demanding that you give. Christ is asking that you would give back what he's already given to you. That the word may go forth, that ministries may be, that may go forth, that may grow. This is resources, and this is what you would call an obedience and part of your faithful walk. Because you have to first believe that God is provider, and that God already takes care of you. And that you need to believe that with the monies that you give back to the church, they will be used for the upbuilding of the kingdom. It's not, don't, don't worry about what you, what other people may say or what you may think. God has everything under control, amen? So we would ask right now that you bow your heads, that you would humble your hearts, and give accordingly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you have given to us. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to give back. We thank you for the shelter you provided for us, the jobs you have blessed us with. And right now, Heavenly Father, we would ask that we would just be faithful enough to give back what you have placed in our hearts. That we may help those in need, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we would ask that you would receive this offering and let it be acceptable to your kingdom. It is in your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. If you will please start from the back as the uh, ushers will show you. Amen.
smell the blood, still work. Amen, amen. The blood still works. How many feel like worshiping today? Come on. Stand on your feet. Let's worship God this morning. Thank God for the blood. Yes, Lord. Come on, Father. That everything. If you think you've been good all your life, you ain't got nothing to dance about. But when you know it's the blood, how many know it's the blood that saves you? Washes you, purges you, cleanses you. Come on, let's do a little bit more of that, come on. Come on, we want everybody to stand on your feet. And let's worship the Lord and give him his new praise. All those live streaming, give God his praise. You might be in your living room, your bedroom, but let's worship him today in spirit and in truth. Come on, the blood still works. Amen, amen, amen. I like that. We can just keep going with that one. Come on. Come on, let's worship him. The blood, the blood, the blood. Put your hands together. You gotta know it for yourself. Come on, worship. I'm a living witness. I'm a worship the Lord, worship him. Come on, say it like you mean it. Give God a hand, clap a break. 
praise. The blood still works. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may have come in tired, but how many feel like worshiping him today? Hallelujah. I don't care what's going on in your life. Now, let me ask you a question. I don't know if I'm going through what somebody told me, menopause, or is it hot in her? <laughs> Somebody said it's hot in her. That's all it is. It's hot in her. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> yeah, let's worship. Come on. Hot with the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, bless him with the instruments today. God, we thank you that the blood still works. Even right now. We give you praise, God, for your goodness toward us. It is a joy to be able to assemble in a house of worship with other believers who have been through various trials, troubles, tribulations, and triumphs and have come as a living witness and testimony that the blood still works. Thank you, Father, for the privilege and the opportunity to even say thank you. Knowing our past, knowing the struggles of our present, and understanding the possibilities of the struggles that lie ahead, it is so refreshing to know the blood will never, ever lose its power. Praise our God. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Father. Touch now your word as it goes forth. Touch the hearts and the minds of us who will receive it. Touch me, O Lord, that I might deliver it in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And Whatever happens, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name. Somebody say, in Jesus. Come on, say it like you mean it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him another hand clap of praise. Amen, amen. The blood still works. Thank you, choir, our music department. Thank God for all of our ushers, our greeters, those in audiovisual. Thank you all so much. Thank God for those who are with our children in Children's Church, and those who are with our teens in our youth church. Thank God for so many of you who are here today. I'm just happy to be here. Amen. I'm happy. Anybody just happy? Amen. You ain't got to have nothing good just happen. Just be happy to be happy. I'm just happy to be happy to know I'm happy. Amen. I'm just, I'm just glad to know I'm happy. You could be happy not even know it. Amen. I'm just, I'm just glad to know I'm happy. Amen. Praise the Lord. There is a word from the Lord today. We won't be here long. We've got to go to Eminence, Kentucky. We're supposed to be there at 1.30 so that they can feed us. And I can't eat until after the service because I will go to sleep. And, uh, but I encourage everyone who can to follow us and go with us to Eminence. It's only about a 20-minute drive, something like that. Uh, and asking that you will go with us as we share in that pastor's anniversary. And uh, they're looking forward to us. They called and asked how many were coming. They wanted to make sure they had a sufficient amount of food. And uh, they reminded us and reminded me to remind you that country folk can cook. And uh, so they told me to tell you that. Just, just want to let you know. Amen. But we are looking forward to going there. So if you can travel with us, 
go with us today. And next week we'll be going to Zion Baptist Church downtown uh, to celebrate their pastor's anniversary as well. And uh, I don't take it lightly when people invite us because I realize that, you know, I'm grateful first and foremost that God would even use us as a body of believers to where others who listen to our radio programs and hear us uh, also invite us into their homes to share with them what God is doing with us and through us. And so I'm asking that we would go and be an encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11 chapter, as we look towards uh, our communion Sunday, uh, every now and again I try to teach on this simply because I want us to understand what we're doing when we engage in this activity and in this particular event called communion. And so I'm going to read some verses quite lengthy, but we won't be long, I promise you. Um, well, begin in verse 17. I'm not going to rush it. I started just go to one verse, but I'm not going to rush it. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait a minute. If you need one, say thank God it's on the screen. All right. Now then, given these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which also I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, Many are asleep. For we would judge, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks damnation or judgment unto himself. I want to talk to you today from the subject, the sacredness of communion the sacredness of communion. While those are coming in, I just want to say that when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to the church at Corinth. 
and he wants them to understand that when we come together for the purpose of sharing in communion, which is also called the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, we are to understand our reason behind doing so. Most of us here know someone or a child, know of a child as adults. We've seen children or we know of a child where when an adult or maybe yourself caught that child doing something and you ask the child, what are you doing? And the child would shrug the shoulders and say, I don't know. Have you ever had that happen? Uh, you ask the child, why are you doing that? And the child would respond by simply saying, I don't know. I've discovered that's how a lot of Christians live their lives. The Bible teaches us that there are two major ordinances that we are to follow, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But I would be willing to suggest that a great majority of believers who participate on a regular basis with these two ordinances, if they were questioned and asked specifically, personally, and privately, why do you do what you do, they would have the response of that child, I don't know. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament in his epistles and letters, is famous for coining the phrase and the words, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. That is to say that I do not want you as God's children to lack knowledge concerning God's Word. Why? Because according to Hosea 4 and 6, it says, God says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge because they reject knowledge. And sometimes what happens to us, because we don't understand or we choose not to try to understand, we just go through the motions of Christianity never fully understanding or realizing why we do what we do. We just do it because everybody else is doing it. And Paul says, I will not have you to be ignorant. We didn't just join forces today just to shout. Thank God we can shout. We didn't just join forces today to sing songs. Thank God we can sing songs. We didn't just join forces today to read scriptures. Thank God we can read scriptures. We didn't mean just uh, join forces just to hear a sermon. We came, our hope, to get some substance. So that when we're asked certain things about the Bible, as believers who have been engaged and connected to the body of Christ for a certain period of time, we ought to not ever have the answer of a child who is immature. I don't know. When we participate in something, you and I should know why we do it. We should know what we're doing and why we do what we do. Jesus never made the statement that I can recall by saying I would not have you to be ignorant, but he would often say to his disciples, these things have I spoken unto you, so are these things have I spoken unto you because. In other words, I'm telling you this because you need to know not only what to do, but why you do what you do. The Bible helps us understand in Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, Solomon, who was endowed with the wisdom of God, the Holy Spirit, and who sought in life to put everything in life to a test so he could discover the true meaning of life. And he concluded in chapter 12 in the last verse, he says, hear the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God, first and foremost, and keep his commandments. In other words, keeping his commandments means knowing his commandments 
Because in keeping his commandments, his commandments are designed to bless you, not constrain you. Everything God does, he did it and does it for the good of humanity and especially for the good of the church. But many of us run from his word because we think his word will refrain us instead of growing us into that which we desire to be. And so he says in Ecclesiastes 4 and 7, he says in all of your getting, or he says it like this, wisdom is the principal thing. But in all of your getting, get understanding. And it is my task and my joy today to try to help you to better understand why we at this church assemble every first of the month to recognize and celebrate the Lord's Supper or the communion or Eucharist. Let me begin by suggesting that the Lord's Supper or the communion is to be sacred because of the person it represents. If you notice, my brothers and sisters, right there in verses 23 to 25, Paul writes this letter and he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. In other words, I'm not just sharing my opinion. What I'm sharing with you is directly from Christ himself. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. Is that my battery going bad? It's a brand new battery. All right, put me on this. All right. He says, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. Somebody come and get this from me. I ain't mean to undress in front of y'all. <laughs> Amen. He broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death Till he comes. Now, I hope y'all didn't miss all those uh, pronouns. And, and, and as Paul was speaking of Christ, Paul says, For I received, notice that, from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you. And everything he talks about, he talks about this commemorating Christ. That is to say that this is sacred primarily because it represents Christ. When we take that bread in our hand and we hold it up and we break it and we bless it, we're symbolizing and representing our understanding that we understand the symbolism of what Christ did on Calvary. When we take that cup and we hold it up and we bless it and we say, drink ye all of it, we are saying that we understand and we're in agreement that Christ shed his blood for the world. And so it's sacred because of the person. Somebody say the person. Because of the person it represents. It does not represent First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town. It does not represent the pastor of First Baptist Church or any other church. It does not represent the priest or the pastor or the preacher or the deacon. It represents Christ. 
because it was he who hung, bled, and died, and who was buried and risen on the third day with all power in his hands. It's the person that makes it sacred. God is holy and in a class all by himself. It's sacred because it's, it's representative of a holy God. God that said, let there be, and there was. The same God that John talks about when he says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's holy because God is holy. It's holy because he's a holy God, one who created all things. The Bible said when he said in Genesis 1, let there be all things that he spoke of came into existence. It's, 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 it's sacred because of who it represents. We don't come together just out of habit. Now the Bible helps us understand that the scripture teaches, he says, as often as you do this. So he does not specify how many times. In fact, in biblical days, uh, oftentimes after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, many of them did this daily from house to house. But he does not specify how many times. But he does say, as often as as you do this. If you do it once a day, remember me. If you do it once a week, remember me. If you do it once a month, remember me. Why? Because it represents him who is holy. And so when we look at this, my brothers and sisters, he says, remember me. And the question might be asked, why should I remember him? Well, you need to remember that what he went through because what he went through is guaranteeing you what you're going to. Let me say that again. It was what he went through that's guaranteeing you and me where we're going to. Jesus says in John 14 and 1, if you believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you uh, that, that where I am, you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So what he went through became the guarantee of what we're going to. So it's imperative for us to remember that because if he had not died, if he had not bled, if he had not suffered, if he had not been hung between those two thieves, if they did not crucify him, if they did not bury him, if he had not risen from the grave, we would not be going to heaven. We would be going to hell. And that's why when we celebrate, we ought to not just celebrate as if it's some common thing. Common means everybody is equivalent to it. Everybody goes through it. But then but one died for your sins. Then but one hung on a cross for our sins. Then but one go into that grave and then but one get up declaring that all power, talk to me somebody, that all power is in my hands. It's sacred because of the person it represents. In Romans 5 and 6, it says, For while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, yet without hope, Christ died for us. Isaiah 53 and 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities, the chastisement, the beating, the whipping that was up on him was for our peace. Not peace of mind, reconciliation with God. What he went through, he went through it for us. And it's sacred because of the person 
it represents. But the second thing I want to share with you as I hear it to a close, it's not only sacred because of the person it represents, it's sacred for the purpose it reveals. This communion that Jesus did in John the 13th chapter, Luke 22, and in all the Gospels, as he shared with his disciples, has significance and has great meaning to it. It is to let us know that the Passover, there's a new Passover. Those of you that understand Old Testament scripture and you understand that the Jews who were incarcerated and enslaved in Egypt, that the last plague that God sent was the killing of the firstborn. And in order for anybody to live, Jew or Egyptian, had to have blood over the post. And when the deaf angel came through at night, at midnight, those that had the blood, everybody in the house that was in a house that was covered by the blood, the child lived. But the houses that did not have the blood, the first child Died. And so the, it has Old Testament significance. But you got to understand that when Jesus sat down and the Jews in Jesus' day, as they commemorated the Passover, there were four cups of wine that was presented at the table. The father of the house, which has always been in God's eyes the leader of the home, would set his family down and the whole family would gather around and the father would sit down with his family and the first cup of wine he would take and he would tell them this cup is the cup of sanctification. This is the cup of sanctification which was used as a means to introduce to his children what happened in Egypt? Jesus told, God told his uh, uh, people Israel not to ever forget to teach their children and to teach their children's children. And the reason the world is in the condition it's in today is because church folk and Christians have stopped teaching the church, I mean the word, and we're starting letting them learn the world. He says, teach them. So the father in his rightful place would sit the family down and he would take that cup of wine and he would say this cup symbolizes and represents what God did for us when he brought us out, separated us from the Egyptians and called us to be a nation. I got to hurry to a close because I said I'm going to be out by 12.30. The second cup was the cup of proclamation. That is to say he would take this cup but he would not immediately drink from this cup. But he would take this cup and he would let them understand and proclaim what God did for the Israelites. He would let them know that God brought them out. And I just want to suggest that if you're here today and if you know you've been born again and you know you were bought by the blood of Christ, and you know the blood still works. Don't you ever become so self-righteous that you forget to proclaim, I'm clean because he made me clean. I'm saved because he saved me. I'm delivered because he delivered me. There ought to be a proclamation telling the story of what God has done for us. You know, too many church folk Get, get, get in the habit of showing up on Sunday and sitting up here like we've never been through anything. Acting like we got it all together. As if everything is always intact. But the truth is, if God would just allow us to see what happens in the lives of us before from week to week, before we meet from Sunday to Sunday, most of us wouldn't show up. But I'm going to tell you why you should show up. 
Not because you're ashamed of what you've been through, but you're grateful for what he's brought you through. And when we show up on a Sunday morning, you ought to have a testimony that does not require a choir. You ought to have a testimony that doesn't require a keyboard. You ought to have a testimony that doesn't require an organ or drums. But when you look back over your week and you think about what the Lord has done and where the Lord has brought you from, you ought to proclaim. I could have been dead. I should have been dead. I would have been dead. But the Lord made death behave. You ain't got to wait on no preacher to proclaim Christ. If he's been good to you, you ought to have a proclamation. You ought to have a story to tell. You ought to have a testimony. The third cup was a cup of blessings. Most scholars and theologians believe this is the cup that Jesus shared with his disciples. And he said to them, this, this bread symbolizes my body. This cup symbolizes my blood. He says the bread was broken for you. In other words, what I'm going through and what I'm headed into as a result of being crucified is for you. I'm not sinning. I'm being broken in your place. In other words, I'm taking your sins to the grave and I'm giving you my righteousness. And so it was a couple of blessings. And I don't know about you, but how many know it is a blessing to be in the Lord? Y'all too cute for me up in here. I said, how many of y'all know it is a blessing to be? Maybe I need to talk to some alcoholics. Maybe I need to talk to somebody that was homeless before. Maybe I need to talk to somebody that was in an abusive relationship. Maybe I need to talk to somebody that was incarcerated before you got saved. And here you are today, and you look back over your life. How many know it's a blessing? Maybe I need to talk to somebody that couldn't pay your bills, but you still got a roof over your head. You still got clothing on your body. You still got a reasonable portion of your health history. How many know it's a blessing? The cup of sanctification, the cup of proclamation, the cup of blessing. But watch this last one. It's the cup of praise. And that is to say that if you remember, in fact, I'm just going to come back to that one. Because I want you to understand that communion is sacred because of the person it represents, but also because of the purpose it reveals. Christ died for us. And he says in these words, whoever eats of this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body. And he's not saying if you sin, you can't eat of it. Because the remedy for us sinning is repentance. And that's why the Bible teaches us in 1 John 1 and 9 that, 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 that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so it's sacred because of the purpose it reveals. But thirdly, it's sacred because, my brothers and sisters, of the purging it requires. For he who drinks or eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, all he's saying is that before you come to the table, get it right with the Lord. And if opportunity presents itself, get it right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. The goal is to keep the body unified. Every time we come together, we show forth the, the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we also participate as the disciples did in the upper room and they were all unified except one. 
which means when we come with factions and divisions and hatred and envy and come in this house without speaking to somebody because of something that happened in the past, we are not the disciples. Or we're not symbolizing the disciples. We're symbolizing Judas. He was the only one that was out of unity with the rest of them. And that's why when Jesus made the profession that somebody will betray you, betray him, everybody said, Lord, is it I? Not because they were wondering. They wanted to get right because they didn't want to be separated from the Lord. And then when it came to Judas, he asked the question, is it I? And the Lord says, you know it. Whatever you do, do it quickly. And he had a chance to repent, but he chose to stay in pride. He chose to not repent and turn from his sin. So he was in disunity. So the Bible says when you come here in disunity with an attitude with somebody else, he says to eat it in an unworthy manner. It's just like Judas who initiated the crucifixion of our Lord. You may, have, you may as well have been the one that got the 30 shekels. You may as well have been the one that gave the report to the Pharisees and told him where they could find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because God demands unity. And so it requires a purging, a cleansing, so that we could be right with God. And I shared not too long ago one of the hardest, three of the hardest sentences that for us to say is I'm sorry, I'm wrong, and I forgive you. We got to get in the habit of it. Because that, that's the way God has established us being right. And I said this morning at 8 o'clock, it doesn't matter what the other person does. You got to do it out of the right spirit and in the right way and for the right purpose. And if they choose not to accept it, that's between them and God. It requires a purging, but then fourthly, communion is sacred because of the penalty. Watch this, it retains. The reason it's sacred is because verse 30 says, for this cause, many are weak, many are sick, and many have died. Now, I looked those words up in the original Greek, and it said the weak basically means, and by definition of the secular definition, of weak is to be feeble or feeble-minded. And so what he's saying is that when we eat this with a disregard of what we're doing and who we're doing it to and for, he says what happens is you become spiritually and mentally feeble. Maybe that's why some of us can't get through our daily trials without complaining and whining and giving up because we're feeble. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons we're still envious and jealous and, and, and hopping from one place to the other because, because we're feeble-minded. He's saying in essence that when you eat this out of the wrong way for the wrong purpose or disregard it for what it means, he says what happens is you lose your strength. God forbid we lose our strength because the strength that he gives us is for the storms that you and I must face because he don't remove the storms from us but he gives us the strength to get through the storms God forbid he takes our strength that's why the psalmist said in Psalm 46 and 1 the Lord our God is my refuge and my strength and a very present help in the time of trouble. I can't stop trouble from coming, but I know how to be strong when it shows up at my doorstep. I can't stop pain from knocking on my door, but I know how to praise him in the midst of my pain. I thank God for strength. He said many have fallen weak. He said second, some have suffered physical sickness. You know what happens when you don't do God's will? 
you get out of the realm of God's protection, Satan attacks you from every side, and then you pick up diseases. Watch this. Get out of the will of God. Step out into the left lane. Get out of his will. You stepped outside of his protection. Because when you were inside of his protection, the enemy came from every angle. But there was a shield of protection around you. But then you got too high on the horse. Are you, you got feeble-minded. Are you did it for the wrong? You wouldn't forgive that person. You wouldn't let it go. You held on to it. And you thought as long as you keep tithing and keep doing all these other good things, God has said, but God is a holy God, a righteous God, a God that is above the, even our comprehension. So we step outside of his will, outside of his word, outside of his ways, and the enemy gets in this time. And now that he's attacking us on every side, we get stressed out. And with stress, we get high blood pressure. We're stressed. We get diabetes. We're stressed. Sickness becomes our fate because we're weak and feeble because we've stepped out of the realm of safety. And the tragic truth is, is that when you stay out too long, you die. You can't stay disconnected from life and still live. You can't stay disconnected from life itself, which is the tree of life, and still live. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree, the scriptures helps us to understand that if they had eaten from the tree of life first, they would have lived forever. But they ate of the forbidden tree. And that's what's happening to a lot of saints today. We keep biting off to that forbidden tree. We let our emotions dictate us. We let bad attitudes govern us. We let our feelings decide how we respond. And as a result, we step outside of God's will. But we're still going to church. We're still going to Bible study. We're still reading. We're still praying. And we can't understand why the enemy is having such a field day. It's because of that little simple thing that a holy God will not tolerate. And so Paul says, don't bring death upon yourself. And some have even physically died as a result. And so communion is sacred. Because of the person it represents. Because of the purpose it reveals. Because of the penalty it retains. But then watch this. Because it offers a promise of relief. I'm so glad that the text teaches us that there is a release. Verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, it's not God's will that any man perish, but that all might come to repentance. In Isaiah 1 and 18, he says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face. When, you, when you're having a hard time forgiving, when you're having a hard time breaking free from that fleshly emotion of doing wrong. He says, seek his face. But you got to humble yourself to seek his face. I mean, when you're seeking his face, you can't go around blaming everybody else. You made me do this. 
If they hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done it. No, no, no. Seek his face and say, God, it is true that people are provoking me. It is true that they're doing me wrong. It is true that they're getting on my last nerve. But it's also true I've not yet grown to a point where I know how to handle it in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. So I humble myself and I seek you to help me. When I can't get rid of them, I can get rid of my feelings. When I can't get rid of them, I can control myself. And so I'm going to tell you that fourth cup. The first one was sanctification, introducing what happened in Egypt. The second one was proclamation, telling your children and your children's children what God has done down through history or what is actually his story. Because I don't care what happens. At the end of the book, God wrote it. The third cup is that cup of blessing. But then that fourth cup was the cup of praise. And it never dawned on me until I did some more research. And then it clicked. The Bible said when they got through with the communion, after they ate the bread and after they drunk the cup, they left singing a hymn. And I stopped by to tell somebody that when you talk about the sacredness of communion, we say it every first of the month, they left singing a hymn. But there was a particular hymn that they sung back in the day. It was Psalm 118. It was a song of thanksgiving. And so here we are looking back as Paul says, realizing that were it not for Christ, who hung, bled, and died, was buried and risen, you and I would not be saved today. But watch this, we not only look back, but now we look forward, because the promise is he's coming back again for those who are connected to him. So what is my song of thanksgiving? My song of thanksgiving is I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. Is there anybody in the house, as you look back over your life, that can say I'm thankful for what the Lord has done? I'm not what I want to be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. I'm grateful for what the Lord has done but when I think about what he's promised me on the other side I'm thankful for what the Lord has done not in the past but in the future it's already sealed it's already made so I thank him for the past I thank him for the present but I thank him for the future. And every now and again, when you get down and out because of what's going on in the present, because it's boiling over from the past, you all remind yourself of your future. And when you can't praise him for the past and you can't praise him for your present, start giving him some advanced praise. Say, Lord, I know I'm going through right now and I don't like what I'm going through. But you told me that some glad morning, when this life is over, anybody in the house got an advanced praise. I'm tired, but I'm a praise him. I'm weak, but I'm a praise him. I'm broke, but I will praise him. I'm sorrowful, but I will praise him. Let everything that has breath praise, praise. Praise ye the Lord. Drink that cup. Drink that cup. I know it hurts, but praise him. He's worthy. He's worthy. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the saints, God is worthy to be praised. I don't care about what you've been through. You better pick yourself up 
you better hold your head up. You better look to the hills from which cometh your help. And you gotta remind yourself, all of my help come from the Lord. And that's what keeps me motivated. That's what keeps me smiling when I should be crying. I'm looking toward my future. I've been through some stuff. I've been through some trials. I'm experiencing some troubles right now. But I can look forward. And I ain't got to wait till I get there to lift up holy hands. I ain't got to wait till I get there to lift up my voice. I've got some advance. Praise. Hallelujah. And you know what advanced praise does for you? I said I was done. But watch this. Advanced praise is like advanced payments. Now, some of you ain't never suffered financially. But let me tell my testimony. You don't get it much on jobs today, but when I was out there in the secular world working, because I had four small children and struggling, every now and again I would have to go to my employer and I would say, I really don't want to ask you this. I'm ashamed, but I can't steal. I ain't going to go back to prison and do stuff wrong. And I need to know if you would trust me with an advance check so I can pay my bills, take care of my family. And I promise you, I will work like I'm supposed to work. I still show up. And every time they gave me an advance payment. Now watch this. The payment was in advance, but I could pay the bills in the present. And I stopped by to tell somebody that when you got an advance payment and you got an advance praise, you're praising about what shall be, but it helps you about what's going on right now. I stopped by to tell somebody, and I just want to ask everybody, is there anybody in the house that's got an advance praise? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Every now and then, you got to ask God for some advance. I can't wait till next week to praise you. I got to praise you. Father, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your son, our savior our Lord and our master. Thank you for past praise. Thank you for present praise. But thank you, God, for advanced praise. And that praise, unlike past and unlike the present, will be perpetual. We praise you, God, and we give you thanks that you've given us just a glimpse and a better understanding of what it means when we come together in unity as one body to eat of the Lord's body and to drink of that blood, recognizing what he's done, reminding ourselves of the suffering, the shame, and the sacrifice that it took for us to be redeemed. We look back, God. We think about that crown of thorns. We think about the blood that came piercing from his side, the blood and water. We think about it, God. And, and in the relation to those cups, most of those cups was, was actually mixed with water and wine. We thank you, God, for Jesus. We pray, God, if there's anybody outside of the relationship with him, those that are present, those that are live streaming, those that will hear us by way of radio, if they're out of the ark of safety and he's the only ark of safety there is, give them the courage and the boldness to come and receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. If there's any person that's wandered away like wandering sheep, bring them back into the fold today and let them know that you're not angry at them, but it's your rod that is drawing them back, that rod of love, that rod of mercy, that rod of forgiveness. Draw them back to you. If there's somebody here today that's disconnected from the body, in a right relationship with you, but have not yet found their body, the local body to be connected to, and you're telling them this is the place, 
let not Satan rob them of obeying you. But may they be obedient and come forth. And there are those that need to be prayed for. Whatever it is, let them come forth. And we'll be careful to do what you've told us to do. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and the glory as we attempt to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we want to extend an invitation to every person who's here today. If that's you, would you come? As we prayed, if, there, if you've never accepted Christ, if you want to rededicate your life, want to become a part of our church family, if you want somebody to pray with you, pray for you. I'm going to ask that you would come today. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. If you've moved away from him, come back home. We've all done it. This is your time. This is your hour. Would you come? If you've never received it for the first time, would you come? Or maybe you don't have a church home. God is saying that this is where I want to plant you. This is where I want to grow you. This is where I want to groom you. If that's you today, would you come? Would you be bold enough, man enough, woman enough, courageous enough to say, you know, God, I can't get there without you. And don't, don't lie to yourself. Don't, don't say, I'm going to wait till I get it myself together. You'll never get it together without him. I was as filthy as filth could be when I came to him. And it's his blood. It's his blood that strengthens me and cleanses me. Not just for eternity. And I've discovered will you trust him today? You want to extend an invitation one more time. If you don't have a church home, you want to rededicate your life, you want to become a part of our church family, I give Christ your life for the first time. Would you be man enough, woman enough, bold enough to make that decision? If you're not connected to anybody, if you're not connected anywhere, would you come? You don't have to be afraid. Your new life can start right now. Your new journey can start right now. God will see you through it. I know he will. Because it's all in. It's not in our power. It's not even in our attempt to do right. But it's him. Every day I get up. Throughout the day. And I'm so glad. It'll never lose. It will never lose. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise in this house today. Amen, amen. There's power in the blood. If you desire to come but did not come, I want to ask that you will uh, see one of these ministers or deacons or myself after service. Let the usher know or somebody and we'll escort you in the back, get some information from you, give you some information on what you need to do to get saved for the first time or rededicate your life, become a part of our church family or to pray with you. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to share in this time of unity. We pray, God, that any factions, any divisions, or anything that we're struggling with from our part. Help us, oh God, to quickly repent of it so that we will not eat of this or drink of this in an unworthy manner, but that we will recognize, looking back over our lives and over history, reminding us of what it took for us to be saved, and then looking forward to your return again so that we might dwell with you forever. Bless the bread that symbolizes that body that was broken and bruised, that was beaten and buried for our iniquities. But blessed, O oh God, that it was raised, a new body, glorified, which is the hope of all of us. Bless this juice that symbolizes the blood that was shed for the remission of many. For all of us who by faith in your grace have become a part of your holy family. Sanctify us, O oh God. Make us holy and holy before your presence. Let our prayers and our presence be acceptable before thine. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus of Christ. Hallelujah. If you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, even if you're not a member of our local body, but you're a member of the universal body of Christ, we encourage you to join us. For we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Has everyone had an opportunity to be served? As the scriptures has taught us. Got two back there. Good. The Bible said when they went up a room, Jesus took the bread. He raised it. He broke it and they blessed it and said, this symbolizes what I'm about to do for you. He broke his body for us. May we eat with thanksgiving unto him. He took the cup and he said to them, symbolizes the blood that was shed for your sins. He blessed it. He said, drink ye all of it. The Bible said they departed singing a hymn of thanksgiving. I pray that we would do likewise. For those who can and will, I pray that you would make the sacrifice of going to Eminence, Kentucky with us. We still get there plenty of time before 1.30. And I ask that you would come and join us as we celebrate. Also, I encourage you to come back on Wednesday. We have our noonday Bible study at one, from 12 to 1. 
we're teaching on uh, prayer. And in the evening services, we're actually having worship services pri primarily. And we're dealing with the faith. And so uh, if you need to build your faith and just encourage me to get through the rest of the week, we encourage you to come out and join us on Wednesday. Continue to pray for all of our members who've had loved ones to pass on. And uh, let's be mindful to show them love. Let's continue to visit those that are in the sick, help feed those that are hungry, and help nourish those uh, spiritually and physically and mentally who are just going through. Amen. So as we prepare to depart, have we already taken up off? Then I'm late. All right, thank you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for today. All we have guaranteed right now by our understanding is right now. Anything could happen. So we are thankful for today. We give you praise for your son, Jesus Christ. And we acknowledge you as holy and to be honored and to be glorified and to be exalted and to be lifted up above all. For you are God and you're God all by yourself. We thank you, God, for the sacrifice, the suffering, and the shame of your son that he endured so that we might have a right to the tree of life and that suffering and shame and sacrifice is the reason behind our salvation. We give you praise, God, for your Holy Spirit that even when your son ascended back to his glory, your love for us wouldn't leave us by ourselves. So you sent your son into the world to embody us, to die for us, but your Holy Spirit to embody us and to live inside of us and to reside in us so that we wouldn't have to run this journey and live this life by ourselves. So God, let us be thankful as we leave this house, regardless of what else is happening. We've got so much to be thankful for. So I pray, God, your blessings upon every home, every heart, those that are live streaming. And I pray, God, that you will bless all of us, that we might bless you with all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that are live streaming, if you have been blessed by our ministry, you can always write us at 10600 Watterson Trail, Louisville, Kentucky, 40299. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful day. Amen.